to review first, um, I, we had talked about uh, fatty acids and how they build up uh, into triglycerides. I talked about chemical ways of breaking uh, triglycerides back down into fatty acids and monoglycerides and how the body absorbs them. Um, how we take fat droplets and emulsify them with the bile, bile salts and the glycerophospholipids um, uh, so that the enzymes that break fats down can gain access to the triglycerides. Well, this is that enzyme. It's pancreatic lipase. And uh, this is a lipase in general is any enzyme that's going to break uh, a triglyceride into a monoglyceride and free fatty acids or the conjugate bases of those fatty acids, meaning the sodium salts. All right. So again, an overview of fat digestion and absorption. There's these three processes. We have emulsification where we go from a fat globule and break it up into these tiny little droplets using uh, the glycerophospholipids like lecithin was one I talked about uh, and the bile uh, salts. Uh, it helps break up the fat globules so that the next step is fat hydrolysis and uh, the lipase from wherever, in this case I have it uh, as pancreatic lipase, a, a lipase coming from the pancreas, can break, it can gain access to the triglycerides and break them down into uh, the free fatty acids of the monoglycerides. And then the third step is simply uh, the uptake of those free lipids uh, into little knee cells, or into ti super tiny uh, little uh, bits, I guess, of uh, fat along with cholesterol and some vitamins, uh, the fat-soluble vitamins that we didn't talk about at all. So that's, that's the general flow uh, of this. So when we, talk, when we get to that point, we have to think about how we're going to get them in the body because uh, fats are totally different than carbohydrates and proteins. I haven't really talked at length uh, in the carbohydrate or protein chapters about how our body absorbs them um, because it's actually pretty straightforward. I'll show an overview in a little bit of that anyways. Um, but these are water-soluble solu molecules. Fat is different. It's different and it's hard because it's not water-soluble. Uh, they're, they're lipid. They're hydrophobic. Um, so we're going to have to, your body has come up with a, a different method for absorbing them. Um, and that's these things called the lipoproteins. And this is how uh, we absorb fats, uh, triglycerides, uh, free fatty acids, cholesterol, etc., into the body. We pack them into these uh, molecules um, that are a combination of the different fats that we're trying to absorb, and various uh, proteins, lipoproteins. Um, these are proteins that have, they, they are also amphipathic. They're going to have faces of them that are hydrophilic, that face outward, and then hydrophobic parts that help keep the fats packed into these um, sort of balls that uh, our body can deal with. So, <clears throat> um, we can classify the different types of lipoproteins based upon their density. How dense are they? So if you were to take uh, a, a dispersion of them, like a, a solution that had a suspension of all of them, and you were to spin it down, they would separate by density, uh, how, densely packed, how densely packed the fats are into the molecule. And uh, there's a functional significance to that as well. So the least uh, dense of them are these ones called uh, chylomicrons, or ULDLs. Um, and they're, they're quite large, uh, so it's 1,000 microns. Um, that's a millimeter. So you, this is like well visible with the naked eye. Uh, it's a millimeter. You've seen a millimeter on a ruler. It's about the, maybe the thickness of your thumbnail, maybe even a little more. So... They, they're, they're fairly large, 
and then it goes down this gradient, VLDL, IDL, LDL, and HDL. Um, the, I'm going to anticipate the end of the story here by telling you that um, one of the most important uh, indices of uh, your blood and these lipids in terms of your potential to develop uh, atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries, uh, plaque deposits in the arteries, is not just the total amount of LDL or HDL, but it's the ratio between those two, all right? So um, to give you an absolute number of LDL, uh, one person can have higher LDL and another person can have lower LDL, but uh, the person with the lower LDL may be in worse shape because they have almost no HDL, and it's that HDL LDL ratio that turns out to be super important. So it's really important to have uh, lots of HDL and less uh, LDL. Well, let's see how that works. So to understand it a little bit, you're going to have to trace the path of, of fat through the body. Some of this is going to be review and some of it will be new. So I'm just going to trace the path of this fat globule, the little like I don't know, the, the grease off the bacon you had with your eggs or whatever this morning. Uh, it's, it's in your gut. The lumen is the inside of your gut. Um, and the darker yellow are the cells, the enterocytes, the cells on the wall of your intestine. The green area you see is actually the lymphatic system. So the, the, the fat is going to travel through the lymphatic system before it gets to your bloodstream. Um, and it's going to arrive via this thing called the thoracic duct I'll talk about uh, before it gets into the circulatory system. That pink stuff on the bottom uh, is just the peripheral tissues of your body, like your muscles or skin or wherever it is in the body that's going to need, need the various lipids to do what those cells need to do. All right. And the important organ, there's only one organ uh, that really matters here, that's the liver. Take care of your liver. Young ones, please. I know uh, that's a message that may not resonate much on a Friday night, but really, your liver is super important. Um, okay, so here's a fat globule, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to be sort of narrating this process with these little darker pink boxes in the right-hand corner there. Uh, fat globule gets ingested and gets emulsified uh, using the bile salts and the glycerophospholipids like lecithin. Uh, then gets digested with the lipase um, and broken down into these little me-cells. Uh, from the me-cells, the enterocytes can leach off the free fatty acids um, and the monoglycerides. They, they, can get re they can get absorbed by the enterocytes in that form. That's how the enterocytes can pick them up. They can't absorb triglycerides. They, they have to get these broken down uh, these broken down fats. Uh, there, they get packaged into these uh, chylomicrons that we were talking about, the ULDL. Um, this is the form that the lymphatic system can handle. All right? They get uh, shunted from the enterocytes and the lumen of the gut into these uh, structures called lacteals, which are uh, these um, lymphatic structures in between the enterocytes and travel through the lymphatic system to this thing called the thoracic duct. Now, the thoracic duct is um, it's in your thorax. It's in your chest. It's, a, it's a, basically a tube. It's a duct that connects your entire lymphatic system in your, your whole body to your circulatory system. And it's how uh, the, um, a number of things, it's how pathogens that have been killed by white blood cells, uh, re return to the blood for transfer to the gut. And it's how fat goes, uh, uh, goes in the same direction from the lymphatic system into the bloodstream so that the, um, liver can process it. All right. So, um, the chylomicrons travel to the liver. And the liver is going to do a couple things. Uh, the first thing it's going to do is 
uh, release some HDL. The liver is responsible for making the good fat, the, the, the good fat that's in your uh, blood, the HDL, and we'll see what it does. So the job of the HDL is to interact with chylomicrons, and uh, it, it helps chylomicrons spin off fatty acids and uh, monoglycerides to the peripheral cells. So as those chylomicrons are going through your circulatory system, uh, they're transporting <laughs> the fats, but they're not able to deliver them themselves. The, the HDL um, helps uh, cleave off those uh, free fatty acids and uh, any triglycerides that may be packed into the uh, chylomicrons. Um, and the HDL themselves, before they get uh, sent back to the liver uh, for recycling, are also able to either deliver or uh, pick up cholesterol. So HDL themselves are primarily cholesterol transporting molecules. They can pick up uh, cholesterol from a cell that has too much in their, um, in their uh, lipid membrane. Or if there's not enough, they can insert some cholesterol in there to make that uh, cell have the right kind of fluidity in its, in its lipid uh, in its lipid outer leaf. All right, so the liver also uh, releases these molecules called VLDL, the very low density lipoprotein. Uh, and this is the way that the liver is able to directly transport uh, triglycerides and fatty acids. Uh, and it, HDL does essentially the same thing to the VLDL that it does to the chylomicrons. It's what potentiates that molecule, uh, that lipoprotein, to unload its cargo, all right? So you can kind of think of, like, the, the ULDLs and the VLDLs as, like, the transport, like, the trucks that are driving around the circulatory system with the fats that they need to deliver. And the HDL is sort of like um, the, the people that are unloading the trucks uh, and taking the fats, the cargo, off of them and delivering them. Uh, to the cells. Is that making sense so far? Pretty straightforward. Well, as this happens, VLDLs begin unloading fats and they become less dense, uh, or no, I'm sorry, more dense um, as, they, as they sort of compact and unload these fats. Um, so HDL is also interacting with the IDLs, the intermediates, uh, and as that happens, we finally get to these LDL um, these LDL molecules, the low-density lipoproteins. When you get to that stage, they, uh, in, in a healthy individual, they're getting uh, shunted back to the liver, and the liver is going to uh, reabsorb uh, that LDL. However, if um, there is an excessive amount of LDL, meaning the liver had, like, your the fats that are being delivered to the liver via the chylomicrons, right? Uh, so that's how the liver's picking up fats. It's exporting the fats via the VDL, um, VLDL. If there's really more fat than the liver can process, uh, has room to process, and there's a number of reasons for that, like the, the liver can also produce its own fat, uh, by one of the, the major ways in America that happens is uh, the liver is the only organ in the body that can actually take up fructose. So all the fructose we eat uh, has to get processed by the liver, and there, we, uh, Americans in general, eat way more fructose than their liver needs. Uh, and so it gets saturated with uh fructose, but that gets turned into fat. You go through fatty liver disease. That's like a downstream, you know, that's the upstream of like metabolic disorder. Anyways, it leads to more LDL in the blood than the liver can process. The liver is just not able to take up all that LDL. And uh, what starts happening is the body, the immune system is like, what? There's something wrong here. And the macrophages, which are these white blood cells that uh, take up uh, pathogens, things that shouldn't be there, they start 
eating the LDL that's in the blood. They start uh, absorbing it. And uh, they go from being these uh, macrophages to something that is um, deceptively uh, fun-sounding foam cells. These things called foam cells uh, start getting produced when you have a macrophage that's been engorged with LDL uh, lipids. And uh, if you get too much foam cell uh, concentration in the blood, they start depositing on the walls of your arteries. Uh, they start building up, and that's, that's what arterial plaque is. So you can see here um, that if you have lots of HDL, that helps deliver the fat, it helps peel the fat off of the, um, off of the chylomicrons, uh, off the VLDLs and IDLs, uh, but most importantly, off of the chylomicrons, so that the fat never even reaches the liver in the first place. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, so the more HDL that's available to process uh, chylomicrons, the better. And if there's less uh, VLDL, then the HDL is not being um, is not involved in that process. Also, if you have more LDL, uh, it sort of swamps out the HDL's ability to uh, interact with those with those fats. So, it's the it's the HDL LDL ratio that's important. Yeah, did I did I trip over my tongue? Yeah, what's up? Um, I was wondering why. Hmm. So, um, well, protein has a different density than lipid um, because, for a number of reasons, but a, a protein has very close uh, contacts, like really intimate, um, very stable, uh, intramolecular packing uh, between the amino acids that makes that protein. And triglycerides and fatty acids don't. There are these like sort of casual hydrophobic interactions. Um, you can kind of imagine it like, imagine a, a friend network uh, on social media, like whatever social media platform you use. And, and you're like, you're friends with all these people that, um, that, it's, it's like totally virtual, right? It's kind of a low density network of friends. But then if you like, and that would be analogous to the fats, right? But if you weed those friendships out of your life and are only considering friendships between like people that you're physically interacting with um, and that you see day to day, that's sort of like a higher density network of people. Um, so here, when you're those fats, they have, they're like very ephemeral interactions. They're not as like uh, tight the, the types of intermolecular actions. And so, as you uh, remove fat from one of these lipoproteins, uh, you yeah, why is it fat? because it's being delivered to the cells, the peripheral cells. So it's kind of like not no, no. So HDL is delivering cholesterol. The job of HDL is not actually to deliver fat. It's to sort of cause the, the lipoproteins that are delivering fat to unload them. Uh, yeah, so VLDL goes to IDL because VLDL is unloading fats. You can see that little arrow that's peeling off there. Uh, so the a HDL, the little white arrows uh, that are pointing off of HDL, uh, are meant to represent interactions where the HDL is causing the VLDL to unload some uh, some fats. So the VLDL unloads fats. It increases the protein to lipid ratio in the lipoprotein, and that changes its density. Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody else? This is a good question. Thank you. Okay. Well, anyways, uh, that was all just to give you the basic understanding of the physiology behind this. And maybe, uh, hopefully everybody here has got like healthy blood lipids, but, um, it, no? Huh? Okay. Well, I don't know. How do you check? Go to the doctor and give them some blood and she tells you what your LDL to HDL ratio is. Um, so, anyways... 
when you look at that number, that y your physician would, would give you a number, um, and, uh, you know, there are, there's, you know, millions of people have done this, and they've correlated it with incidents of heart disease and, uh, and atherosclerosis. I mean, they, they actually understand the molecular mechanism in, at a fi far higher resolution than even what I showed you there. Uh, so they know what these, these brackets are and the risk that's associated with them. Um, if you have, uh, you know, a, a ratio that's under five somewhere, uh, under four and a half, then you're at, you're at low risk, uh, meaning if you have a fairly high amount of HDL to LDL. That doesn't mean you need to have more HDL than LDL. It just means uh, that you need to have, you know, roughly for every four molecules of LDL, if you have uh, a molecule of HDL, you're in great shape. Um, and then uh, as, that, as that number changes, as the LDL swamps out the HDL, uh, then you, you are much higher uh, risk. So, I don't even know what all my statements at the bottom there are. But, yeah, I guess just summarizing all that. Okay, so uh, here's the actual epidemiological data. Um, once you get above like 7 uh, for an LDL to HDL ratio, your risk goes way up, right? So at 8 um, or up to 32, you have a 7% chance. If you get up into the larger numbers, um, you know, like if your LDL to HDL ratio is 100 or more, there's like a very slim chance that you don't have uh, coronary artery disease. 1 in 25, I guess. Um, all right, are there any... Questions on that? That's really all I was going to talk about. How often does it occur? In like, does your risk go up? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's one of these things where it's kind of cumulative. Um, you know, you maybe you had really poor diet at one point in your life, so you have, you know, an extended period of uh, high LDL. Uh, but then you get your blood lipids under control and that comes down, you are uh, reducing the risk of uh, deposition, you know, and so that's fine. But there, there's like still a, a fingerprint from the, the history that you had. Um, you're more resilient as you're younger. The good news is, um, so, you know, having high LDL in your 20s uh, is easier it, like you have reduced risk than if you had high LDL in your 40s or 50s, for example. But the bad side of that is if you have high LDL in your 20s, you're much more likely to have high LDL in your 30s and 40s and 50s as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a trade-off. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Um, really talking about... <sighs> I mean, this is scratching the surface of this. The question that you may be asking, you may ask yourself was, well, how do I get high HDL and low LDL? Um, and that's a, actually a pretty sophisticated question. Uh, but to, like, um, to, to fully unpack would be a full lecture. But to give you the, the short answer to that, um, it's... It's good to have, well, certainly good to have a, a diet that's low in trans uh, fats, right? Because the body doesn't really know how to process trans fats very well, and that leads uh, to more fat being uh, resident in the LDL. That it hasn't been spun off into your cells. Uh, it, it, trans fat is going to lead to a lot more LDL and foam cells. So you want to avoid fryer fat if you can as much as possible. Uh, particularly vegetable fried fat. Um, and uh, then it gets more, more complicated when you start talking about saturated versus unsaturated fats. Uh, saturated fats tend to lead to higher LDL. Um, and, and then it gets 
again, a layer of nuance when you start talking about omega-3 versus omega-6, the essential fatty acid ratios. But in general, I did kind of cover that already. Uh, it's the American diet needs significantly more omega-3s in it. So if you're questioning what should I do, well, really the answer is eat more omega-3 fatty acids, cut trans fats out, and try to moderate your saturated fat, right? So that's, that's the, the real answer. Uh, okay, so let's, let's escape that. Uh, were there any questions? That, I kind of breezed through that because I didn't want to get caught there too much. You don't eat LDL. You make LDL. You eat fats that that uh, you, you eat fats that lead to the production of LDL. Right. So if you have uh, a, a diet that's high in fat, or if you have a diet that's high in sugar, particular like so dietary sugars, not fibers uh, or like complex carbohydrates, particularly starch is okay because that's just glucose, and that and the glucose can be used by all the cells, but uh, sugar that is either fructose or sucrose, because half of sucrose is fructose. You guys know that at this point. Uh, that fructose, it, the like terminal place for that is the liver. And that if you're eating more calories than the liver can utilize in terms of fructose, then all that fructose is getting made into fat, and that's going to throw your blood lipids off. I'm going to show you guys a slide later that that shows how dramatically – uh, sugar can affect blood lipids. Uh, it was a study that was done on uh, obese children, and they did uh, calorie uh, sugar limitation on them. After just nine days, their blood lipids, their LDL, their blood pressure, uh, a number of metrics all improved. There was no change in their weight, which gets at another point here is you can't really tell anything about a person's blood lipids or their underlying physical health by their weight. Uh, people. So we live in a very discriminatory uh, society, where, in kind of a vain society, where people are focused on that external. That is not the measure, right? There are, that, that's not the measure of, of health. Um, it, it can correlate uh, with a lot of these things, but it's not the universal, universal measure of, of your health. Okay, so we're going to start to get into that here. Uh, I want to talk about um, metabolism and what a calorie is in obesity. We've talked about the macronutrients. I want to talk about how the body uses energy uh, for a couple, uh, a couple lectures. And I'll have a little activity where you guys can sort of try to put uh, these ideas into practice, interacting in a small group. You don't have to listen to me for once. Uh, before we get there, though, I want, again, I love whenever I start these new topics, I like to, uh, it's kind of a way for me to take attendance and get a sense of uh, where you guys are at. So I'm going to have you answer a couple questions. If you'd whip out a piece of paper, it'll get me a chance to set my timer for the day here. Was that little bit about the fats useful? Was that interesting? Felt like I would have stopped short of really taking that to a more useful point for you guys if I hadn't talked about that. All right. Um, so I want you to think about the food you eat. We've talked about carbohydrates now. You know what they are. Uh, and, and when I say carbohydrates, I'm talking about sugars. I'm talking about starches. Uh, that you're using from, that you're uh, getting from the amylose or whatever. And I'm also talking about fiber, right? So soluble and insoluble fiber. All three of those things are carbohydrates. Um, and then proteins, we know what those are. And then fats. What are the relative uh, percentages of each of those that you think you eat in your diet?
Okay, well, you're all, that's a pretty easy question to remember. So as you're, I'll go on to the second one. So now, uh, not asking about your diet anymore. I'm asking about carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. You, this information you do not have. I did not give this to you in class yet. We are going to be talking about this. That's what the rest of the lecture is about. But I just want to see what you already know. Um, if you are going to estimate the relative energy densities uh, of those three categories, what, what would that be? And um, so when I say energy density, estimate how many calories, so calorie is a unit of thermal energy per gram of that food. What are the, the relative energy densities in calories per gram in the, cal, in the carbohydrates, uh, proteins, and fats that you eat? What, what's that relative uh, cal energy density? Yeah. Here, this is not percent. This question, so the first one was per percent. Yeah, that's fine. Yep, yep. Yeah, if you can make them add up to 100, that would be ideal. <laughs> but uh, yes, they should add up to 100. But how do you want to say it's the energy density one? Like, just how many calories per gram do you think a, a, a carbohydrate is? Uh, how many calories per gram do you think a protein is? And how many calories per gram of fat uh, is there? I know. I I understand that you have no reason to know the answer to these. But I'm I'm just some of you will know. Some of you won't know. Last time I asked this question. Class got stunningly close to the actual answers, so it was interesting to me. When you're done, just put your name, send it in to me. Yeah, so you're guessing. I mean, these are all just guesses. If you put your name on it, I know you were here. If you don't put your name on it, that's what we do. Small calorie or oh, have you been looking ahead? I haven't even posted these slides. It's you. Um, I, I I used a big C on the slide, didn't I? It's okay. That doesn't. You. Did you take this class already? Uh oh. It's cool. You can read that. See how far I get. If I don't uh, get to it, I'll have your numbers. If I do get to it, we'll have last year's numbers. Okay, so, yeah. The calorie is actually kind of a difficult uh, concept sometimes because there's been such confusion. If we could go back knowing what we know now and build the world over, so much of history hopefully would be different if we were able to look at, uh, look at the mistakes that we've made, right? And the calorie is one of those things. It becomes very confusing uh, because the definition of the calorie has changed with time. And in fact, uh, nutritionists talk in one language and scientists talk in another. I am a scientist. I don't even think in calories. I think in something called a joule. Um, but, or actually kilojoules is what I think in. Uh, but... Calories are what nutritionists talk about, so uh, we'll, we'll use the calorie. The calorie is kind of an antiquated concept, and we'll, uh, to really understand what the, the calorie is, we got to talk about the history of, of the calorie. The question that uh, Theo so presciently uh, posed, uh, is, do I mean big C or little c calorie? What the hell? Yeah, we'll see what that, what that means uh, in, in a moment here. Um, I should say this. I have kind of 
um, fallen away from the podcast. I had posted some. Did anyone listen to any of those about the carbohydrates? I didn't. Oh, you did? Good. I didn't test over them. Um, were those interesting? Did you guys like those? Kind of? Yeah. History. Um, there's another one. I just posted another one about calories on there. And I, I am going to ask a question about it uh, as like sort of mini quiz, uh, maybe next week sometime. So please listen to it. It's short. It's on, I think it's gastropod. should be well produced. Interesting to listen to. Okay. So when you see calorie, uh, if it has a big C, uh, a big C calorie is equal to 1,000 small C calories, uh, which is also equal to one kilocalorie. So a big C calorie is a kilocalorie. Uh, and this is, so all these numbers I'm giving you are kind of anticipating uh, the end of the story. Um, I'm going to go back and tell the sort of history of how that evolved, why it's like that. Uh, but one um, small C calorie is 4.184 joules, which is the metric unit, uh, this, the System International, uh, the SI unit. Um, and thus, one big C calorie is 4,184 joules, or one big C calorie would also be 4.184 kilojoules. Uh, kilojoule is the unit that most scientists uh, like, like to talk in. They're pretty similar. So this, the beginning of this story goes back to this guy. Uh, and I, I love him for so many reasons, such an interesting dude. Uh, first of all, his first name and last name was... The same, and it's not like John John or something like that. It's Santorio Santorio. Um, so he got really interested in the way the, the body uses energy, and he wanted to explore that. Uh, so he developed this. Um, he lived back in the 16th century and early 17th century, and he, he developed what was really the sort of the first uh, metabolic chamber. This, this really crazy chamber that you see right here where um, he had a table on one scale, end of a scale and a, his chair where he was on the other end of the scale and uh, he measured what he ate uh, and the change in mass, right? Going from him, uh, the food to him. And then he also masked all of his excretion. Right, so he he like weighed how much fluid he drank. He weighed how much food he ate, and then he weighed how much he crapped and and urinated. Uh, and he looked at the change in his mass, um, and was able to come up with a, a sort of a rough estimate of uh, the food that the mass of food that was being converted to physical energy in his body. This was the first sort of sense that anybody had that food uh, was the source of energy that people uh, utilized and, and that mass in some way represented uh, energy, chemical uh, mass represented energy. He did some other interesting things. He's the first guy to invent the clinical thermometer. Look at that fun thing right there. Uh, it was this you know, big glass tube with a giant knob of glass uh, immersed in mercury and you have to stick that giant bulb in your mouth and the heat of your mouth would force the mercury, uh, would expand the gas, force the mercury down into the reservoir and you could measure the difference there. So, yeah, no, you have glass in your mouth, but I would be surprised if you didn't get a little mercury in there. Anyways, uh, he was interested in, uh, the, the, I, the reason I bring that thermometer point up is he was interested and, and understood the connection between uh, the mass change in the food that we ate and the body's innate ability to produce heat. So the bodies are warm, we generate heat, and he like had some kind of understanding uh, between, between those two. And he was trying to make a connection between like variations in body heat and variations in body mass. Right, so this is sort of the beginning of 
the concept of calorimetry. Um, you know, a, a hundred and fifty years later, uh, if I talked about Lavoisier, I think I might have during Carbon. This guy was was him and his wife. I talked about uh, Madame Lavoisier as well. They were brilliant individuals. <clears throat> Sadly, lost their head and to the guillotine um, in the in the populist uprising there of the French Revolution, but. This guy was uh, the first to really uh, develop the first uh, genuine calorimeter. And in fact, his calorimeter was a little bit more sophisticated than the one uh, that we even made. But uh, this one looked uh, at the ability of the heat, the innate heat generated by a, uh, an animal to melt ice. And so he has... Uh, this outer sleeve of ice that's insulating an inner sleeve of ice with a mouse kind of stuck down in there. And the mouse is generating some heat, it's melting the ice, and then he compares that to control without the mouse, uh, looking at volume of fluid uh, evolved from the melting of the ice and how much the mouse sped up the melting of that ice and as a way of determining how many calories or how much chemical energy, because Lavoisier was thinking about chemical energy. Remember, he uh, sort of articulated the chemical process behind combustion. He's the one that gave us the modern definition of the element. Um, and he was thinking about heat of combustion and the amount of energy a chemical reaction is putting off. In fact, we know that combustion is, is the, the oxidation of carbon is really the process that our bodies are going through when we eat carbohydrates to extract that uh, that energy. So this is a direct extension of that work that he did with, with carbon and the combustion of carbon. And he was trying to measure, uh, he was trying to measure heat evolved uh, by these mice. He knew how much uh, the mass of carbon they were eating in terms of the food. And then uh, he would uh, be, make these mice live in these ice chambers and uh, probably not very fun for the mice, but uh, better than sticking a person in there. What's that guy's name? Wim Hof? Is that his name? That really far out dude that like swims in the Arctic Ocean and like melts ice with his body. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Well, anyways, <clears throat> let's keep moving forward. Next century uh, was this guy, Nicholas Clement. Um, he uh, gave these lectures. I don't have a picture of Nicholas Clement. There are, were no renderings of him, but there's his grave. You can go check that out uh, next time you're in Paris. Um, him and this other individual named Sadi Carnot, uh, who is uh, known as the father of thermodynamics. Uh, he was a quite young man. Uh, Carnot was a bit of a genius who um, got diverted into the military and his scientific uh, genius uh, perhaps was not developed as, as well as it could be because of his other military pursuits. But the the two of them um, were able to calculate the mechanical equivalent of heat. And so when we were thinking about heat, people were having a hard time understanding, like putting it into terms that they could understand. And that's what I'm going to try to do for you uh, in, towards the end of this lecture. Not today, probably next time, I guess, or two times from now. Uh, you know, a calorie. What what the hell is a calorie? What does a calorie do? What can I what how much work can I get done with a calorie? Um, I'll I'll show you those numbers. Uh, but it was these people here who first tried to understand uh, the calorie in these mechanical uh, terms, right? So the heat that our body can generate, this thermal energy, what does it mean in terms of how much power output, sustained power output, that a machine might be able to make, right? Because this was in the early 19th century. This was at the beginning of, you know, steam-driven uh, mechanisms and uh, thinking about mechanical power, how to make machines that are going to do work for us by burning something, for example, or generating steam. Uh, all right, next slide. So <clears throat> by the uh, mid to late uh, 19th century, they had settled upon this definition. They, because everybody was like, 
there were people all over the place. Saadi and Car uh, 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 Clement and Carnot had been uh, had really thrown this idea out there at the beginning of ther thermodynamics and, and mechanical equivalence of heat. Uh, so a lot of people started doing these on either side of the English Channel, both on the continent and in Britain, uh, and they didn't have a standard. The problem was uh, when you publish some results, the units that you were using, if, if you made them up or only like your tiny little circle of people that were at your school that you talked to had a single unit, then that paper was kind of useless to somebody else because they weren't, you were using totally different units, right? And you, they didn't know how to speak the same language. And so they, um, they worked, tw so the like global, um, we'll see how, how the, there became a global consensus on, on units. However, the definition of calorie uh, is, um, for, it was first published in 1863 in this Journal of Nutrition titled The History of the Calorie in Nutrition. Uh, this was when the Emancipation Proclamation, the first uh, Republican president, signed the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, so what was that definition? Uh, it was the, the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of a kilogram of water by one degree centigrade. All right. So up until this point, uh, there had been a lot of work. Uh, Carnot and Clement had been using uh, uh, European standards for that. People in Britain had been using this thing called the, the BTU, which is still, uh, you still see the BTU. I'm not going to talk about that, but the, the British thermal unit. Oftentimes, the British thermal unit is a unit that's used to describe uh, the efficiency of houses, um, like how many BTUs does it take to heat your house. Um, anyways, so a kilogram of water is essentially a liter of water because a liter uh, is defined as uh, 100, 1,000 grams of distilled water. So, um, yeah, it's the amount of heat needed to raise uh, a liter uh, by one degree C. And here is that original def definition that the... Uh, the definition in English that was first published in 1863, it was referencing the uh, description by Clement back in 1825. So this is really where that definition uh, was established. Clement said, uh, une calorie est uh, et la quantité de, I don't know, whatever. But it's, it's the amount of heat needed to raise a kilogram of water by one degree C. Someone who speaks French in the class better than I, I can read that for us. Um, and then it reproduced again in the uh, 1883 in the Imperial Dictionary. It was that Imperial Dictionary that was read by, ooh, I got super close. This was, this is the last, this is the slide I wanted to end on. Um, uh, that was picked up by this guy named, uh, Wilbur Atwater. And um, we'll, we'll stop it there.